Coffee hour. I'm Sarah Golset. I'm Eddie Bates. It is Maundy Thursday. Holy Thursday, Maundy not, not Thursday. Not Monday Thursday, Monday Thursday. It's not a week full of Mondays. It is not, well, I don't know about that. <laughs> it is Thursday of Holy Week, and uh, we're going to talk about uh, one of my favorite things for the whole program today, which is very exciting. Uh, and hopefully, uh, we, we have sung some of these hymns during the week, and, and we will sing more this weekend. So, Joining us in studio, Philip Magnus, uh, Director of Sanctuary Worship at Concordia Lutheran Church in Kirkwood, Missouri. Welcome. Oh, Thanks for coming over. Happy to be here. <laughs> Talking about some uh, some great hymns. We, uh, we'll talk about uh, the hymn of the day uh, for today, Monday, Thursday, and um, tomorrow, Good Friday. And then we're actually going to get a sneak peek of sneak peek of Easter. How's it running? You're trying to say preview. Preview, sneak preview, sneak peek, yeah, uh, uh, of Easter. So uh, so we'll get a little... A little spoiler alert. Spoiler <laughs> alert. Yeah. If you don't want to hear about Easter yet, <laughs> pause when you're halfway there. Um, so uh, we're jumping into uh, to Maundy Thursday, which is the service tonight. Uh, and the hymn, uh, or the, the hymn of the day for this service is uh, Lutheran Service Book 617, O Lord, We Praise Thee, which is probably a very familiar hymn. We sing it all the time uh, during communion services, probably. Uh, what do you want us to know well, right off the bat about many this Many churches one? <laughs> do sing this one. This is one of the great chorales of the church, and it is one that you can pretty much pull out stops on in any parish that you play <laughs> out, and the people will, will sing it uh, and sing it well. Uh, the hymn goes back to the um, back to Luther and the uh, early Reformation. It was in um, the second Lutheran hymnal worship resource. It was more for a, a, a choir and for a home, home devotion, but it was included in the 1524 uh, in Caridia, which was released right after the first Lutheran hymnal, the Oct Leader Book, the Eight Song Book. Um, but here's the cool thing about this hymn. It is a medieval Liza... And those, that was a type of congregational song of the pre-Reformation era. Yes, Virginia, the congregation did sing hymns before Luther. <laughs> <laughs> There's this um, romantic, romanticized uh, history out there as if there were like a, a tape on all the Christians' mouths. And then Luther comes and opens up the floodgate of song. And that is really not the case. And uh, Probably on another show, you could have uh, Dr. Joseph Hurl on, and he will he will tell you all about the the long struggle to really develop uh, singing in the evangelical church. There were places that sang, places that didn't didn't sing, and in many parts of Germany, there were uh, various laity uh, hymns of the laity, and this was uh, one of them. At least the first stanza mm -hmm. was. Um, now, this was this stanza was typically sung at the Feast of Corpus Christi, which is a hymn, a festival that we Lutherans reject because that's when the uh, you know, medieval church and, and Roman Catholics to this day, and many countries have a big Feast of Corpus Christi to this mm -hmm. day, like Island of Grenada, their big you know, Roman Catholic procession, and they process the, the sacrament around. And of course, Lutherans rejected this practice, but it's a wonderful example of how Luther and Lutheranism practices a, uh, a conservative approach to Reformation. We keep babies and get rid of dirty bathwater. <laughs> uh, yeah, G.K. Chesterton famously uh, said the difference between a reformer and a radical is that the radical says, I don't understand this, let's get rid of it. And the reformer says, oh, I don't understand this thing. Let me study it and decide what's worth keeping and what's, what's worth getting rid of. Mm -hmm. Well... So Luther um, takes this hymn, he sanitizes it a little bit. There was a line at the end I won't go into, has some history to it that uh, he thought, you know, didn't have the best association. And then he wrote two new stanzas. He referred to this hymn before it was published as a, as a hymn for the evangelical churches uh, in the foreword to his formula Missa, his, uh, his, second, his uh, first mass before the German mass, the, the, the Latin mass that he did, which was uh, used in the um, city and academic churches in, during the Reformation era for you know, a century or so, um, recommending this as a good hymn to be sung. 
And accordingly, in many of the liturgies, if you go around to the various church orders of the various um, um, states or kingdoms, principalities of uh, Germany, uh, and the various uh, churches, uh, this was often prescribed as something to be sung during the communion or to be sung at the end of communion. Um, so it has a wonderful, wonderful history to that. But I think it's very interesting that you know he takes something that was associated with a feast day. And he's like, well, we're not doing that anymore. But ah, oh, but this hymn is excellent, and let's do something with it. And it was also smart because he was able to draw on something that the people knew. So when he wrote additional stanzas to it, they were able to readily sing it. Hmm. Right. It wasn't something totally new for them. They could. They knew the melody. They could. They could sing it. Hmm. What else do you want us to know about, O oh Lord, we praise Thee? Well, a little interesting theological point might be made. We, we, of course, we do not derive our doctrine from practice, but our practice flows from our doctrine. Sometimes when people point to our practice, um, you know, we can get rightly skittish or defensive, saying, well, hold on there, you know, let's, let's go to the Bible, um, or let's go to the Confessions. Um, but it's interesting that Luther himself, with the proper understanding that good practice flows from the correct doctrine, nonetheless pointed to this hymn. So he actually did have the practice himself sometimes of saying, well, look, we sing this hymn. And, of course, the understanding was the hymn had been vetted and it was part of the teaching. Well, he uses this when in arguing against the Roman practice of the time of having communion in one kind, <laughs> because this was a longstanding medieval Liza, which obviously had, you know, stood, had the imprimatur of the Roman church and said, well, hold, well, this, this hymn shows that we say, we receive the sacrament in both kinds. Um, so that's kind of an interesting little, little tidbit. So, you know, rightly understood, if we understand that it's, uh, that, that the practice flows from the doctrine, it, it sometimes is uh, illustrative and helpful to, to point to a practice and say, well, this is why we, you know, we're doing this and this is why. <laughs> I want to move ahead to Good Friday sure. before we run out of time. <laughs> um, sing my tongue the glorious battle, oh. 454. Twist and shout. Book. This is one of my faves. <laughs> it's so good. It really is. <laughs> it really is. Well, this is another example. Looks like we have a theme for this segment of the Reformation rather than the radical approach. <laughs> <laughs> because here we see a hymn from the 6th century that mm -hmm. was cleaned up. Originally, th this is from a, a hymn that had ten stanzas. We have five in our in our hymnal. Hmm. The original ten stanza hymn was written for the present uh, for the presentation of what were claimed to be relics from the Holy Cross hmm. to a queen, uh, Queen Ragagunda. I guess before French sounded very French in Poitiers in five sixty nine, and. Um, so Frankish kingdom there, and this queen has this new cathedral, and she gets this big delivery from the east. Here are the relics, and Fortunatus writes this glorious hymn. And it's a great hymn, but some of the stanzas are a bit you know, problematic with some of the claims they make. <laughs> um, part of this hymn was, uh, late, um, was used during the um, Reformation era for the royal banners forward go. These stanzas were taken by, uh, uh, by John Mason Neal. Uh, he took five stanzas and um, and worked this into a, a suitable, glorious hymn for Good Friday. John Mason Neal uh, was a, um, a major hymn writer and translator of what was uh, known as the Oxford Movement in Anglicanism in the 19th century. It paralleled the Lutheran confessional revival, uh, similar sentiments, reactions against uh, pietism, and um, a desire to recover um, church fathers, uh, the confessional documents. Uh, so it was a conservative um, movement, both in Anglicanism and in Lutheranism. And uh, so something that our Lutheran reformers, uh, you know, our Lutheran fathers of the 19th century looked with favor upon the Oxford movement. So it's no surprise that when Lutherans began to worship in English, they took many of the hymns of the Oxford movement writers because they comport with biblical and evangelical theology. Hmm. So anyway, yeah, so, so there you have another example of something. It's like, well, this hymn's got some issues, but you know, we can clean it up and we have this wonderful pearl. Yeah, yeah. And of course, the, the tune is written by, by uh, uh, Carl Schalk. So he's, and wonderful. he's, and he's, he's alive and you can have a beer with him so we, we can call can. this contemporary worship. <laughs> <laughs> he is, uh, he's such a, great uh tune writer composer 
I guess that's the word for it. He's a tune writer. Tune writer. Uh, well, he's, a, he's a composer, <laughs> and he's written many fine tunes. This is early Shock. Yeah. Um, get this. The tune with this text first appears in a youth magazine in 1967. This is early Shock. Hmm. And this kind of makes me wonder if, if our, uh, our friends at Higher Things are out there listening. Maybe y'all should start putting some hymn stanzas in your magazine or some hymns. And, and you never know, you might come across, uh, you might you know, help the church discover the next Sing My Tongue for the next <laughs> hymnal. Something that, that my husband always likes to point out in this tune is that if you, if you kind of draw lines between the notes, the notes create a cross. Oh, yes. Ba, 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 ba. It creates a cross. And it's, it, I don't know if that was on purpose. I don't um, remember very, that part very of little Carl does is not on purpose. <laughs> so I would, so you, so Andy and, and Sarah, you, you need to have Carl Schalk on your show now. That would be so fun. I don't think I should draw in my hymnal, though. Uh, I can draw in mine. It's, it's my hymnal. <laughs> 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 what else do you want us to know uh, about Sing My Tongue before uh, before we go to break? We have about two minutes. Well, you know, I, I, tongue in cheek, you know, joking about contemporary worship, but this, you know, this was a, a cutting edge hymn in its time, and. If you look at Dr. Schalk's uh, music and his hymnody, most of it's written with choirs and organs in mind, especially uh, you know the middle and, and later Schalk works. But in the 60s, he was writing resources uh, for, um, along with his other music and his, and his other things he was doing, but one of his projects, he was writing resources so that uh, you could have good songs that were playable and you know, able to be accompanied and led by guitar. And um, this uh, hymn fits that bill, and so um, that's sort of an interesting uh, little 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 thing. So you, it's, it's a it's a great tune, and it sounds majestic on organ with brass. But you can also play this with uh, with um, with a guitar or piano led ensemble. I wonder if our friends in uh, Latin America and Caribbean region sing this on guitar. I'd love to uh, hear when that. When I've sung this That'd tune so with cool. my French brothers, uh, Frank, my, my Francophone brothers and sisters in Africa, they, yeah. they love it. Oh, that'd be fun of course, to Of course, there's no guitar. It's just drums yeah. and voices. That's but, true. But, <laughs> it's, but, it's, but, it has, <laughs> but it has that cross-cultural appeal yeah. to it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We are talking with Philip Magnus, Director of Sanctuary Worship at Concordia Lutheran Church in Kirkwood, taking a look at the hymns of Holy Week. Now, we are moving into... Easter. Easter resurrection. Spoiler so, alert. spoiler alert. Stick around. You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. Four years on Sunday mornings, Worldwide KFUO has been broadcasting live worship services for those unable to attend worship or for those who enjoy hearing God's Word. This Sunday, our 8 a.m. worship comes from Peace Lutheran Church in St. Louis, Missouri, with presiding pastor Rev. Dennis Cassens. Our 1045 worship comes from Hope Lutheran Church in St. Anne, Missouri, with presiding pastor Rev. Tim Ostermeyer. Join us on Sunday mornings on Worldwide KFUO. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. Hi, this is Bart Day, President and CEO of Lutheran Church Extension Fund. Every day, our Lutheran schools reach out to children and families with the love of Jesus. Our schools are a rich and vital component of the church, and in fact, they are the single greatest ministry we share that can shape the future growth and expansion of the Synod. And so whether it's a customized loan to fit your school's particular needs or help living out your ministry's God-given purpose, we want to help your ministry flourish and grow. So visit us at lcef.org to learn Learn more. Welcome back to the Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. It is Monday, Thursday. We're talking Holy Week hymns with Cantor Philip Magnus. <laughs> He's director of Sanctuary Worship at Concordia Lutheran Church in Kirkwood, and always good to talk hymns. That's on the top of our list. Hymns and missionaries. Hymns and missionaries. Uh, two of my favorite things. And if you add bicycles to it, then Sarah's totally happy. It's true. And coffee. Oh, and coffee. And then I'm good. <gasps> yeah. <laughs> that reminds me of something I totally forgot, but we'll save that for another day. <laughs> Don't you like that senior moment? That was great. That was uh, so great. now we're getting into <laughs> Easter hymns. Um, so if you need to press pause and then unpause it on Easter morning, you can. But these are some of the hymns that we're going to sing on Easter. Yeah. Uh, so let, let's take a look at them. Uh, do we want to go to 467 first? Sure. All right. Yeah. It's my favorite. Awake my heart with gladness. This was not a hymn, believe it or not, that I grew up with. Really? Now, A, I was 
a convert to Lutheranism in eighth, ninth grade. But the church I went to in high school, the church I went to in college, the first church I started off in, in Texas, didn't have it. And then at, when I was at Trinity Peoria, uh, first thing a new cantor does is, they should do is, you know, learn the repertoire of the congregation so you're not picking too many things. And you know, I made a few mistakes when I first was there. So then I immediately said, okay, let's get a, let's get a survey going. And I had, um, I had the help of uh, some wonderful um, seasoned citizens who went through five years of hymnals and let me know, you know, how many times <laughs> every tune had been sung. Wow. And this was not in their repertoire. <laughs> so, um, my second year there, um, there was a young lady in my Scola Cantorum, Natalie Teichman, and um, she's a professional dancer now in New York, and uh, delightful. She was a de delightful person, and she was a delightful uh, uh, student chorister, and she told me she had, she says, Cantor, I had this dream last night, and I don't know, it, I heard this wonderful music, and we were all singing Alleluia's, and it was some kind of Easter Easter song, that, and I, but I don't know, you know, you know what it was, but we were singing in parts, and it, w it was awesome. Um, can you write an Can you write an Easter song for us with lots of hallelujahs? I mean, what, what, what are you going to do with that? But it's like, okay, Natalie, I'm going to work on that. So, not being someone who writes a lot of texts, I write music. I have yeah. maybe two or three texts I've written over the years. I'm just a, I'm, I'm a song I'm a tune writer and musician comp composer. So. I start looking in the hymnal and I go, oh, this, these words are awesome. Paul Gerhardt, for the win. Yay. Of course. So I'm like, well, <laughs> great. The congregation doesn't sing this hymn, but they can hear the hymn and they can hear the kids sing it. But Natalie wanted new music. So I kind of took the first phrase and reworked it. And then I had some other ideas and I wrote this anthem. Um, and so I uh, fell in love with the words of this particular hymn before I fell in love with the music. Hmm. And then, oh, a few years later, I read an article by Paul Grimm um, about, about, the, about this hymn. I was like, you know, I really should just go to the organ and play this hymn as it's written. I'm like, oh, this is a great hymn. Well, then, you, you know, you change <laughs> congregations and then, you know, you, 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 um, you wind up discovering that, you know, there are congregations that do sing this hymn, sing it well. And, you know, so anyway, I'm a late, I'm a late comer to it. But... Uh, so I want to focus on the text of, of this hymn, which um, is a great example, as in all of Gerhardt's hymns, of a really good balance between the subjective and objective aspects of our faith. Hmm. Early hymnody is very much, especially early Lutheran hymnody, is very focused on objective, you know, getting our doctrine right, singing uh, uh, catechetical hymns, hymns which teach the faith. And they're wonderful hymns, and here comes the, the however, um, but they, they don't focus much on the experience of the Christian. And Christians, often we want to give expression of the hope that is within us. And what Gerhardt does is he has that really good balance where there's still a lot of objective, good content, singing the truth, um, and also expressing the feelings of the Christian. Um, in fact, uh, the, you know, this being a German um, hymn, a German chorale, the tune name is the same as the hymn name. Uh, so you might think that Auf, Auf, Mein Herz means Awake My Heart, but it actually means Up, Up, My Heart. Hmm. Up, Up. Uh, isn't that wonderful? You know, you have this first some quarter during the liturgy, Lift Up Your Hearts, you know, and, and here, you know, Gerard has Up, 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 My Heart. Uh, so, our theologians talk about the fides quae and the fides qua. The fides quae is the uh, objective, um, you know, the faith by which we are saved. And early hymns do that. But there's also a fides qua, your experience of saving faith. And that's what Gerhardt does so well in so much, much of his hymnody. And so this hymn takes something like uh, some verses like Micah uh, 5, verse 9, Your hand will be lifted up and triumph over your enemies, and all your foes shall be destroyed. And, of course, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And he puts it together in this wonderful hymn and, and just makes everybody sing up, up. 
<laughs> well, now I, now I want to know the rest of the German text. It's so fascinating <laughs> yeah. to, to just to, to have because I mean, translating uh, any any poetry from an, uh, from one language to, into another, you're just, you're just going to lose some of it just Correct. because yes. of the way it happens. But oh, I'd love to know the rest of the German. Is this one? Do you know if this is one of the Gerhardt hymns that that it has like twenty stanzas and we shortened it down to something that didn't make people so angry? <laughs> <laughs> I I don't I, don't, I, I I'm not an authority on that and, and I have to go look that up now. You have to look that up. What what this um, you know the previous segment we had an appeal or I had a personal appeal. It's like yeah, it'd be great if higher things would run hymns, new hymns like uh, Spirit Magazine did for the Lutheran youth in the '60s. Um, well, this is just another this is another personal appeal. Can't wait, um, all of you who are working on this uh, for. Um, the worship department of our Senate and CPH to get that hymnal companion for LSB. Oh, yes. I am still waiting for that to come out. And, and for the past four or five years, I keep hearing how it's coming out next year. So soon. <laughs> it's coming soon. out soon. Coming soon. <laughs> it's, so. Isn't it that the Lutheran answer now, not yet? Now, yes, not yes, yet. yes, 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 exactly. We are, we are still waiting. Uh, there's so much more we could talk about. So it's with... inaugurated eschatology with the hymnal <laughs> supplement. <laughs> Okay, go ahead. <laughs> so, so much we could talk about with this. And, and I would encourage um, anyone who hasn't, uh, ha, well, has or hasn't sung this hymn yet to to read it again uh, before Easter morning, just to, to get the text in your head. It's just so good. It's I think fabulous. it's my favorite, probably yeah. my favorite Easter text, but I haven't looked through the rest of the hymn yet. So. Uh, but anyway, um, before we run out of time, uh, we want to get to the to the next our last one. If Christ had not been yes. raised from death. Lutheran Service Book 486. You have some personal connection to this well, I wrote one. A t I wrote the tune for oh, this one. Oh, look at one. that. You did. Yeah. <laughs> um, when they were, uh, we were developing um, LSB, uh, several uh, composers were uh, given text uh, with the instruction that, or just the encouragement that they had located several uh, delightful, wonderful uh, hymns uh, for which they wanted new tunes, so they didn't feel like they had suitable tunes for them. And so Jeff Blurch, Kevin Hildebrandt, Stephen Johnson, they've got, you know, several, you know, tunes. And so they're all part of this project. Mm -hmm. And the fun thing about it is um, if, if we sing, if Christ had not been raised from death, uh, Stephen Johnson and Kevin and Jeff, I know that they've got their own tune going through their head that they wrote for this. And when I sing one, and when I sing one of theirs, you know, so I'll go like, oh, yeah, Kevin's tune was better than mine. No wonder they picked Kevin's <laughs> tune. But, you know, this, this was a pretty good tune, and they, and they, and they picked it. And um, so with our – we don't have a lot of time, so I want to try to zone, zone in on the story for this. It is a delightful uh, hymn by Christopher Idle. He has several in our hymn book. So uh, hymn fans, uh, you can associate him also with In Silent Pain – the Eternal Son, uh, Christ is surely coming, since our great high priest Christ Jesus and also the saints in Christ are one in every place. So, uh, he's uh, 80 years old, is, uh, is uh, Reverend Idol. He's uh, an Anglican churchman and he has given a lot of great hymns to the church. As for my tune, when I was given all these texts to muse on, my grandmother passed away. Hmm. And so I went down to Tennessee for her funeral. I think I mentioned earlier in the segment that I'm a convert to Lutheranism. Mm -hmm. Okay, so most of my family, uh, my father's side especially, are Southern Baptists. My grandmother had left the Southern Baptist Church and had started going to uh, New Life Tabernacle. And um, so that created a bit of a tension because my cousin Rick and also my aunt and uncle were at the Baptist church. It was my other aunt and uncle, but of course the Baptists, you know, Lutherans think this is just a Lutheran thing, but it's, it's, it's a confessional thing across denominations. Uh, the Baptists weren't going to have this Pentecostal pastor come into their church. And of course they didn't want to have the funeral at New Life Tabernacle, so they did the nice, you know, you know Southern Midwestern compromise. We'll have the funeral at a funeral home. All right, so, you know, here's Lutheran boy here, and uh, what few Lutheran relatives I, I have are on my mother's side, so I'm, I'm just, you know, in, in, the, in the Lutheran delegate, um, delegation. And um, anyway, so I'm, I'm watching this funeral with, 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 with interest as well as with devotion, um, and, the, and both pastors get to preach. And the first one who comes up is from New Life Tabernacle, and it was a, an illustration, frankly, of what should not be preached at a funeral. And sometimes uh, people who live in a Lutheran bubble don't believe things like this go on. But he preached works. Mm. He actually crescendos up 
to um, this this high point in his in his in his, in his sermon after telling the obligatory Protestant uh, nice things about my grandmother and how, how he knew her, he crescendos up full of emotion, uh, like a stereotypical revival preacher, and he, uh, and he says, and I'm here to tell you that if anyone's made it to heaven, Etta Marie did because she was a good woman. And I'm just, I like sink in that. I'm sinking in the pew. It's like, oh, I've got some cousins who really don't get the gospel. They need to, you know, I'm not sure if they do. I, you know, anyway, but I'm like, oh, they don't need to hear this. Oh, this is not what church is about. And um, totally, totally preaching works. Well, thanks be to God, Brother Rick gets up, the, the Southern Baptist gets up. And he says a few nice things, the obligatory nice things about my, uh, my grandmother. And then he turns around and he says, but I'm here to tell you that Etta Marie wouldn't be kicking up her heels right now at the throne of the Lamb if it weren't for the blood of Jesus. And then he, he opens up the scriptures and he goes to 1 Corinthians 15, if Christ had not been raised from death. And I'm like, I'm, I'm musing on this text right now for this <laughs> hymnal project. So I go back to my hotel room and uh, there's my inspiration for this tune. So you sit down and you just start writing? Um, the tune came to wow. mind. Yeah. Wow. What a moment. If that yeah. is an inspiration. Yeah. <laughs> wow. And wow. that's going to be too long of a story to make the <laughs> hymnal companion. So, K- <laughs> so KFUO listeners, you've got the whole story. Catch the story right here. This is the only place you can get the stories. The story behind the music. If Christ had not been raised, uh, that's 486 in Lutheran service book. Uh, if Christ had not been raised from death. Ah, oh, man. So now you're going to yeah, think the cool of that story. The cool thing yeah. is that following, when LSB came out, I sent... Um, a copy of the hymnal uh, to my aunt and uncle, and um, they had the choir on Easter sing. Oh, wow. Oh, that's yeah. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Huh. What a story. Man. We are all out of time, uh, but there is, uh, well, I'm sure we'll have more hymn stories with we you in the future. <laughs> uh, blessings. God bless you this, uh, this Holy Week, this Monday, Thursday, Good Friday. All the, the Holy services, Saturday. Uh, Holy Saturday, that's right, all the services. <laughs> Thank you so much, Phil, for being our guest. My pleasure. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. <laughs> The Coffee Hour with Andy and Sarah is a production of KFUO. To support the Coffee Hour and KFUO Radio, visit KFUO.org. You can also text KFUO to 41444 or send an email to gifts at KFUO.org. And you can call us at 800-844-0524. KFUO. Christ for you. Anytime. Anywhere. Don't, 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 don't